And they compared outcomes in care homes owned by asset managers with other privately owned care homes across the whole of the US. And they found that mortality rates were substantively higher in care homes owned by asset managers. Your rent is getting more expensive. Your bills are getting more expensive. Everything, it seems, is getting more expensive. Why? Well, a big part of the explanation is financialization. People in the financial services making tremendous amounts of money while ordinary people struggle. Many get poorer. But it turns out the masters of the universe, those running the financial services, aren't necessarily the cliches and stereotypes we often think about. They aren't the Gordon Gecko of yesteryear, the investment bankers who often come to mind. In fact, the companies who increasingly control much of the infrastructure we depend on are asset-managed funds. They control tens of trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure. But here's the thing. That isn't enough, because they broadly want all of it. Yes, when it comes to the public sphere, these people want to privatise everything. Now, this may sound complex, quite esoteric, but I don't want you to worry because today's guest has written a brilliant book and is a fantastic communicator when it comes to all things asset managed funds, asset management society related. Brett Christophers, welcome to Downstream. Thanks for having me. We are talking about a very complicated subject today um, and I don't want people to be put off. Because actually, A, it's hugely interesting. B, the insights you've got in this book, which we'll be discussing, are really important and I actually think kind of intriguing. Um, and finally, what I think you've achieved in this book in particular is to take a part of a term that I think most of our audience will understand, be familiar with, financialization, and actually explore a big part of that, which is asset management. Yep. Don't switch off. Yeah. Asset management. I know it sounds, we'll, we will, this will be fascinating, believe me. These are the people who run our lives. Um, in your words, our lives and their portfolios. And at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. It's just made to seem complicated, I think is a big part of the story. Yeah. So let's start from the top. Yep. What's asset management? So asset management is, I mean, to the point of complexity slash simplicity, is a very, very straightforward business. Asset management is a is a form of financial investment, the specific characteristic of which is that the institutions that do it are investing money that, for the most part, is not theirs. So asset management is, is literally the business of taking money on behalf of others, whether those are individuals or institutions, and investing on their behalf um, and aiming to deliver a financial profit for those clients, basically. That's what asset management is. It comes in lots of shapes and sizes, and, and we'll talk about that, but that's basically what it is. So capitalism is, you know, that classical um, process of MCM, money, commodity, money. You make money from money. That's what capital is, money that makes money. Again, that's meant to be complicated. It's really not. Uh, and, and this is a particular kind of it. Now, we've talked about what asset management is. That proceeds through asset funds, what are hedge funds? What is private equity? Okay. Yeah. So I think that's a really good place to start because um, terms like hedge funds, private equity will be terms that um, viewers will be will typically be much more familiar with than with asset management. But asset, but hedge funds and private equity are all creatures of the asset management world. So the, the way asset managers work um, – typically is they establish investment vehicles through which they carry out their investment. So the, the money that they invest on other, others' behalf gets pulled together in these investment vehicles, which are typically funds, investment funds, um, and that's how they carry out their investment. Now, those investment funds come in inordinate different, of, inordinate different kinds, and hedge funds are a particular type of investment fund managed by asset managers. Um, so, um, and, and they have particular characteristics. So a hedge fund is an investment fund that um, for which the investment strategy is often very, very different from a typical investment fund. So a typical investment fund will aim to 
buy assets at a particular price in the expectation and hope that the prices of those assets will go up in will go up in value and then you can sell them at a higher price later. Hedge funds use different strategies, one of which is the aim to try and make profits in a falling market, um, which which often is referred to as shorting stocks. So a hedge fund is simply a type of investment fund managed by an asset manager with a particular investment strategy. A private equity is another type of investment fund. So private equity funds are funds managed by asset managers that invest in shares that are privately held, hence private equity rather than public equity. So they're not investing in shares that are listed on the FTSE or the New York Stock Exchange or whatever. They're investing in shares that are privately owned. They're not traded and listed on public stock markets. That's all private equity is. So asset management's been around for a while. Um, and they've had, like I say, had these funds which draw money from multiple sources, tiny bits of their own, but it includes pension funds, yep. sovereign wealth funds, and they make investments in things historically like corporate bonds, sovereign debt, uh, stock, blah, 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 normal stuff. What has changed in the last 20 years, 25 years? Again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is your sort yeah. of hypothesis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that asset managers are now increasingly investing, trying to find returns from what are called real assets. Exactly. So what what does that mean and, and how is it different? Yeah. So that that's uh, the way you describe that history is, is exactly right. So broadly speaking, until the 1980s, all of the money that asset managers invested got invested in financial assets, as you say, bonds and, and equities of different of different kinds. It was in the 80s they started to, to invest in real assets. In the beginning, that was essentially called commercial property. So, you know, uh, office blocks, shopping centers, hotel chains, that sort of thing. Um, and then from the 90s onwards, you added two new types of, as you say, quote unquote, real assets to that. So the first was was residential property. So housing in different forms, whether that's you know apartment blocks, single family housing, student housing, care homes, even mobile home communities in the US. And the other one was infrastructure of various types, which can be energy infrastructure is probably the main one. So infrastructures of energy generation, transmission, distribution, um, transportation infrastructures, roads, bridges, tunnels, parking systems, telecommunications infrastructure, and also social infrastructure, things like hospitals, schools, prisons, and so on. Um, and I guess the main argument, I'm, I'm one of the main arguments I try to make in the book is that, you know, when asset managers just invested in financial assets, what they did was actually pretty far removed from our daily lives, the daily lives of most individuals. But once asset managers are owning and controlling the houses in which we live, um, the roads on which we you know, drive to work or pay tolls, the hospitals in which we're being treated, the schools in which our, our children are going to school and so on, then they potentially have a far more significant and far more direct impact on the daily lives of um, you know large large numbers of people than they did back in the day. Um, and you know one of the examples I cite in the book is the is the Australian asset management firm Macquarie. Which is, which I, th I think, by almost any measure, is the biggest asset manager in the world in terms of investment in infrastructure. And on its website, it, it estimates that around 100 million people around the world use uh, ev infrastructures every day that it that it owns. So it's yeah, it has a huge insofar as it determines the conditions in which those infrastructures exist. It determines the fees that we pay to access and use those infrastructures. It has a huge impact on people's daily lives. And 99.9% .9 of those 100 million people would have no idea that those infrastructures that they are using and, and relying on every day are owned by this kind of abstruse financial institution headquartered in Sydney. Mm. Macquarie, of course, involved with Thames Water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that more, <laughs> okay. but that's exactly the kind of Absolutely. thing they're involved in. If you're wondering why the service Absolutely. is getting poorer, your bills are going up, here's the reason why. And, and again, why this is an important debate moving away from abstraction is that more and more people are alive to the idea that financialization is taking over the world. But asset management is is what it looks like, and that's what it means. You know that. So I think that's the big takeaway for, for, from this conversation for me and and from your book, is that p 
people intuitively know that. Whether you're a football fan and your club's been bought by debt leverage takeover like Manchester United yep. or 101 other clubs, or um, you don't understand why your water bills go up and yet the service gets worse, and you think, well, it's financialization. We don't really know what that means. This is a really good explanation as to why. You and, and, sorry, and, go on. And, and, there's a, and, and I think just to the, to the point of kind of ramming home the point about the significance it's, you know the, the the simple reason why they're so important today. Forget about kind of what it is they're buying, what they're investing in, is that they have so much capital at their at their disposal, right? If you look at if you look in recent decades at the the amount of surplus capital in the world available for dis, available for investment, whether that's held by pension funds, whether that's held by sovereign wealth funds, has increased dramatically, and at the same time the proportion of that surplus capital that is invested via asset managers rather than directly has also in increased dramatically. And so today, asset managers control over $100 trillion of capital for investment, whereas in the 1970s, it was considerably less than $1 trillion. So it's been one of the most significant changes in the modern history of contemporary capitalism. $100 trillion, just for you know context, what the UK economy is about $2.3 trillion. The global economy is about 100 trillion or less. I think it might even be less. Yeah. yeah. In my head, I think 80 trillion. But that's probably because I read like, you know, The Economist seven years ago yeah. or something. Things move on. Yeah. But it's a, it's a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Broadly equivalent to global GDP. Um, you said that there's been a big change here. So again, people my age who are getting on a bit, um, who were politicized by the financial crisis, we obviously look at the, the bad guys as the banks. Yeah. You've got to tax the banks. Yeah. One of the insights here is actually... A huge amount of power has gone from banks that we might recognize who aren't just obviously operating on the high street like HSBC or Citibank or whatever. A lot of that power and a lot of the things that they're responsible for are going to asset managers. Can you just explain how that's worked? Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true. And there's lots of, there's lots of different dimensions to it. Um, and any, I think the, 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 probably the, the first thing to say is just as one kind of very sort of... Um, in a way, trivial, but also, I think, quite telling measure of that shifting influence. You know, when I was younger and, you know, people would talk about the influence of the financial sector on political political parties in the US, UK and so on, you would always think of, you know, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and so on as having kind of the ear of government as being those that were kind of shaping government policy in one way or another. That's just not really true anymore. So whenever we hear these days about um, financial sector lobbying and 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 governments and governments around the world coming under the influence of the financial sector, it's almost invariably Blackstone, BlackRock, KKR, and others like that. So that's just one measure of that shifting influence. And the financial crisis definitely hastened that. And I think one of the reasons for that. Probably the biggest reason for that was that, you know, while while a lot of us on the left like to think, well, you know, the financial crisis didn't change anything. Well, it did change a lot of things. And one of the things it changed is that the banks did come under much more significant regulation, not least in the US through Dodd-Frank after the financial crisis. And they were... Which was a piece of legislation. Sorry, yeah, yep. a, a piece of financial uh, regulation. And, 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 and they were sort of increasingly constrained in what they could and could do. Um, and asset managers escaped that. Um, and I think in particular, the type of asset manager that I, that I talk about in the book, and we can talk about their specificity in due course, escaped that. And so while the banks kind of got hobbled a little bit, asset managers and, and what our people will often refer to as shadow banks, more generally, sort of continued on their merry way. Um, and that's just continued to, to be the case ever since. Um and so I, th I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, and again, one of the measures of that is that one of the things that the Goldmans of this world have tried to do in the last decade is precisely to pump up their own asset management divisions to try to keep pace with the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and the, and the Blackstones of this world. How much are people in this industry being paid on average? The average person that goes to work for, there's the big three in the US, Vanguard, um, State Street um, and uh, Black Rock. Yeah. People working in that game, not the top, top, top level, but average earner. What are they on? I think it, I, I, you know, I don't know about the, the industry-wide figures, but there was definitely, there was a piece in the FT about a year ago, I think it was, 
that found that average salaries at Blackstone, which is one of the big players, were $2 million. Now, that's, I'm guessing, a mean. And so, you know, you will have in there people earning $700 million at, at the top or whatever. But this is a this is a lot of money, and 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 essentially what my understanding now is that you know twenty years ago, if you were coming out of Harvard or a business school or wherever else, and you wanted to go into financial sector and earn a lot of money, you'd go to an investment bank to do that. Now you might do that, but you do that as a stepping stone to go and work for an asset management firm like a private equity house, and in fact, and in fact, the interesting thing about it is you sign a contract with that private equity house almost before you sign a contract to go and work for two years at an investment bank. So investment banking is not where the money is at now um, if you want to work in the financial sector. It's at asset management firms, and in particular, it's at asset management firms that specialise in in private equity and hedge funds. Now, the reach of these guys is huge. Um, and this is something actually that the right has been quite alive to because of the whole debate around ESG, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, important but yep. i think for people on the left probably not as important as the stuff we'll we'll touch on this big three of blackrock state street vanguard yep how much um equity do they own in terms of businesses on the s&p 500 in the united states these big corporates in the us what percentage of those businesses have some ownership given over to these these companies yeah so um the, the the big three, as you as, as you say, the, the distinctive thing of their business model is that, for the most part, and in, in, in the cases of Vanguard and State Street, essentially the whole business, it is funds that are passively managed funds that, excuse me, aim to track particular market indices like the S and P five hundred or so on. So whatever the constituents of that index are, it will just the fund will just mirror that. Okay, and. In a way, this has been really good for individual investors like us who want to, who have a bit of money to invest because because it's people passively with pensions. Ma- just to be clear, or yeah, whatever, yeah. because just because they're passively people. managed, the fees are really low, and that's, in a way, if there's one good thing about the asset management industry is that it it's made available at very low cost, um, um, diversified investment opportunities for for, ordin- for ordinary people. Okay, now. And again, because they are index trackers, they are diversified. They invest in every stock in that index. Um, and the more, the more that all that you know that that pool of surplus capital out there that I referred to earlier, the more of that that gets the, that it gets funneled through the Black Rocks and the State Streets and the Vanguards, then concomitantly, the bigger proportion of their collective shareholdings. And so. I think the latest data I, I saw was that on average, between the three of them, they would typically own somewhere between 20 and 25% of the shares of, a, of, a, of all major US corporations across every sector. And again, that, that's passively held shareholdings. Incredible statistic. Yeah, it's a huge statistic. So you know, S&P 500, it's like, I think, it, yeah, it's, it's almost all of them. And you're saying between 20, 25% of the... It, it's held by those three. Incredible. It is incredible. Um, but... I guess one of the things I think it's important to remember is, first of all, that, say, BlackRock individually has maybe, say, 8%. It holds that 8% through a whole range of different funds, the individual managers of which probably aren't talking to each other. They may not even know who who each other are. So so that's one thing. The other thing is that... um, you know, BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street may collectively own twenty two percent, but I think it's I think it's somewhat far fetched to perceive them in the way that often people do, which is this kind of cartel that are kind of, you know, nefariously getting together and plotting how they're gonna manage This is the, the right wing sort of critique, right? In the US in particular. Exa- exactly. exactly. Because I just I just I just don't think that's true at all. And actually not just on the right, but I think sometimes on the left people people make that mistake. Um, you know, they're not that interested actually in getting involved in what those co- companies, I mean, they've, they hold shares in 15, 20,000 companies. No, it's not like they're kind of figuring out how to influence management, all those different companies. It's very passive. So just to clarify, when I say, because again, people might not have heard of asset management 10 minutes ago. Now I'm saying, well, the critique from the right in the US, what does that mean? Uh, basically around ESG and DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, what's viewed by the right as a woke agenda 
they say, well, how come all of these companies right across the United States all of a sudden care about pride, LGBT inclusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera where it must be because they all have some ownership given over to these exactly. major companies like Ex- BlackRock who have Ex- an agenda. Exactly. That's yeah. their critique. Yeah. yeah. And so, and BlackRock, you know, the, the very high profile head of BlackRock, Larry Fink, you know, comes back and say, you know, we're, we're not woke capitalists. That's, that's not what we're doing. You know, we're just, we're, we're just oriented towards financial returns. And it's, I mean, as you've already hinted at, it's kind of it's ridiculous that he even has to say that because, of course, of course, they're not woke capitalists. They're just trying to maximise re- their returns for their investors and for the, and, and and therefore for themselves. So we just mentioned Larry Fink. Who are BlackRock? They're one of these big three companies. What kind of scale are they operating at? So BlackRock um, is, I think, by any measure, um, I, you know, I haven't looked at the most recent figures, but the big, the biggest asset manager in the world in terms of the amount of capital they manage on behalf of their clients, somewhere in the order of ten trillion dollars. So we're talking about, given that the whole industry manages about a hundred trillion, we're talking about a ten percent market share by assets under management. And as I said, they um, predominantly their business is this low fee um, business of of of. Um, passive asset management, where you're where you're tracking particular uh, market indices. So it's a, it, you know, in terms of business models, this is a volume business model. It's pile them, you know, it's pile them high, and and they're competing on cost. So you know, Vanguard's funds are, are charging fees of 012 percent of the amount of capital that investors invest. Then BlackRock will respond with 0.115 percent or something like that. So it's it's low margin, typically high volume business. That part of the asset management universe, and they are somehow related to Blackstone. So there's Black, two. These yeah, are not the same are, ones. Blackrock yeah, and Blackstone. They they and people get them confused all the time. Blackrock emerged out of Blackstone. Blackrock was essential. So Blackstone originated, I think, it was launched in 1988. In the early 90s, Blackstone launched essentially a new division, which became BlackRock, and it, they, they then separated in the mid-1990s. And actually, the chief executive of Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman, is another person a lot of people will have heard of, another larger-than-life character, says to this day that was like the worst business division decision of his life, um, selling off that part, because BlackRock went on to become this kind of mega giant uh, earning lots of money who went on to employ george osborne briefly i believe i think that's right yes Which i'm is, not sure i think about, i think so I'm not briefly sure like some consultant yeah, yeah I think so. but i mean i mean there's a there's an important point there which is like which is basically that asset managers these guys have become the place where government people um regulators central bankers end up to earn their payday after they've operated. So Mark Carney, who was governor of the Central Bank of England, is now uh, the vice chairman of Brookfield Asset Management. Tim Geithner, who was the treasury secretary and, and, and kind of screwed over US homeowners in the foreclosure crisis, He's now, I think, at Warburg, Pincus, or one of the other big... I mean, this, so in the old days, people ended up at investment banks after they'd done their thing, and now they end up at asset management firms. We'll, we'll talk about this in a bit, but you know, you talk about Blackstone and BlackRock basically writing US climate policy or being major um, influences on, quote-unquote, Bidenomics, why they like it. We'll, we'll park that for a moment, but it's interesting because, like you say, before 2008, everybody was saying, look how many people are coming from Goldman Sachs into the Obama administration. Now it's, it's Blackstone diff- and BlackRock. It's a different part of uh, different part of those industries. On housing, let's get on this because this is yep. the most substantially important thing I think for people watching this. Why do these businesses like housing assets? Why do they like real assets in general? But why in particular do they like housing? So yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, there are lots of reasons, um, and 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 it's super interesting. And and I think. The first thing to say is that they were historically wary of housing. I, th- I think that they, you know, particularly in quote unquote homeowner societies where, you know, it's everyone's dream to own their home. They were wary of investing in housing, rental housing, owning and then letting it out to people because they didn't want to be seen to be kind of tramping on the home ownership dream of lots of people. But I think what, and I think again, this was another respect in which the financial crisis was really important because um, one of the things that um, became 
very clearly and forcefully argued during the financial crisis was that the financial crisis was deemed to be kind of evidence that home ownership had hit its natural ceiling. So we got to about, in the US, for example, 70% home ownership, but that was too much because we, officialdom, banks, had lent money to people who we shouldn't have lent money to subprime borrowers and so on and that was our mistake but the the crisis was therefore evidence that we'd pushed the home ownership dream too far and that actually the natural ceiling of home ownership is somewhat lower than that so actually there is this rump of 30 40 percent of people who shouldn't and can't become homeowners and therefore it's entirely natural for there to be a class of corporate professional landlord who can do the job more professionally professionally and efficiently than mom and pop small time mom and pop landlords and we beneficent landlord be beneficent asset managers will come in and play that role and that's what they did after the financial crisis and they found um, you know they'd invested a little bit in housing in the past but they found that these were just fantastic asset classes to own um I think one of the, one of the big reasons for that is that they began investing in housing at a time in history when um, when there were already um, significant shortages of housing in in major metropolises around the world, um, and the financial crisis only exacerbated a kind of secular downturn in construct in construction rates so they've come to to be significant owners of housing at a particular time in history when not enough housing is being uh, is being built and that just has a long term um um kind of underpinning uh impact upwards impact on rents so they found housing to be a very very attractive asset class they've been very very good at you know if they own um if they own you know, relatively dispersed, if they happen to own relatively geographically dispersed portfolios, they've been very good at using digital technologies to kind of um, render much more efficient their operational management of, the, of those portfolios at very, very low cost and so on. So housing has been a, fa- a fantastic asset class for them. Um, and they've just, and they've just continued to double down in that investment. But I think the other, the other um, thing about the timing of it, and this is a really, really important point, is that if you think about what invests, I mean, go, go back to whose money is being invested, right? It's, it's typically things like pension funds that are, you know, probably 50, 60% is still pension fund money going through asset managers. What are pension fund trustees looking for when they invest our, our retirement savings? They're looking for two things. They're looking for capital gain. They want the value of the assets to go up, but they're also looking for regular annual yields. They want assets that will deliver five or 6% yields year on year, predictably reliably uh, from year to year. Now, in the past, before the financial crisis, fixed income security, so bonds, did that. You could invest in corp- you know, a corporate bond fund and get your five, 6% regular annual yield. Um, and, and you were happy to do that and you'd find your capital gain elsewhere. But obviously what happened in the wake of the financial crisis was that you had a long period of which we're only coming out of now of incredibly low interest rates kept low by the particular type of monetary policy that was used after the financial crisis. And suddenly investors like pension funds found themselves in a position where the, their traditional sources of those regular annual yields were now returning 1% or 0.5%. And they were like, well, where do we find those regular annual yields? Housing and infrastructure. That's that's a big part of the reason why investment by asset managers on behalf of pension funds and others after the financial crisis exploded because they they thought, well, here is, is where we can find those yields that fixed income financial securities are no longer providing for us. Um, and and that has, a, and, and you know, this is, this is, Another really important part of the story is, is is that if you can get those if you can get those rents year on year six seven percent yields uh, through through rental housing, if you can then increase those rents while you own that housing, when you not only does that provide more income year on year, but when you come to sell that housing, handing it off to another investor six or seven years later, you can you can charge much more for that asset 
that apartment block or whatever it was than you paid for it in the first place. So they've made huge amounts of money from housing investment in the last decade or so. So, you know, people often talk about we're uh, in an economy defined by rentierism, neo-feudalism. I mean, this is what it means Absolutely. substantially. Absolutely. Um, and some of the stuff in here, particularly around um, these guys have a vested interest in there not being enough housing. Because this is their model. The model is they're not being enough housing. Oh, we wish we could, but no, this is their model to not have And I think housing. this is this is one of the key points that's really mis- misunderstood widely. And you're, ap- you're absolutely right. So so go- you often listen to, to governments and now to governments and policymakers when they talk about how we're going to solve the, the housing crisis. Not just in the UK, but everywhere. Everywhere's got a housing crisis pretty much at the moment, uh, which is not just about shortages of, of housing, but it, in significant part, it's about shortages. And they say, we need investment in new housing. Who's going to do that investment? Institutional investors are going to do that investment. No, they're not. They say they're going to. But the last thing they want is much more stock coming into the market because that's likely to have a depressive impact on rents. And indeed, you know, if you want, don't you don't have to believe me for this, but there was a great interview that the FT did a bunch of years ago, I can't remember the year, with the man who at the time was the head of real estate at Blackstone. And, they, and, and, they, and he said that his motto as an investor, his, his strategic motto was look out for capital and cranes. And what he meant by that was if you have invested, if, you've got, if you're invested in property in a particular neighborhood of a city, whether that's commercial, residential property, doesn't matter. If you're invested, what are your warning signs that tell you it's time to sell? building capital and cranes when capital and cranes start coming into the neighborhood that's when you sell so not only is the argument that we asset managers and institutional investors are interested in building lots of new housing not true it's the diametric opposite of the truth and also with housing it's a great um, hedge against high inflation see that's that's exactly right and it's, it's actually a, for, for various kind of arcane reasons it's actually a better hedge against inflation than commercial properties rents get reviewed on a more regular basis and so you can re-peg them to current price levels more often than you can with commercial property so a- absolutely um so housing has proven to be a very very um popular and attractive and enduring asset class for asset managers since the financial crisis in particular. They were there before the financial crisis, but they're there much more actively now. Before we go any further, just to quickly say, you know, um, Rachel Reeves has talked about a sort of advisory board about how do we, you know, restore prosperity to Britain. And some of the people on this advisory board include asset management firms. Yeah. And, and this is why when people say, oh, you know, we've got a radical economic offer. Look, if Aberdeen um, um, and, and companies like that, this is one of these people in this space, if they're on the advisory board committee, it's not going to happen. And it also goes to this idea of Labour's um, green sort of industrial policy of 27, 28 billion pounds a year. How much is from the state? We don't know. Realistically, this is what it looks look like to me. The state might put in two, three, four billion uh, de-risking, allowing these guys privately to make a ton of cash, a ton of cash, and the role of the taxpayer is de-risking their investments, and we are gaslit into being told that socialism, and it blows my mind. Yeah, yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that's that's the basic policy scene at the moment, not just in the UK, uh, but internationally. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I don't think it's the case that that asset managers and their and their institutional investors that they represent are never going to build new housing for the buy, for the build to rent market they'll build some but the last thing they're going to do is build substantial quantities because that goes diametrically against their their business model i think the other thing i'd say i mean i think you know the political class has got itself into a kind of a into into a into a bit of a into a bit of a twist here where where you know, if you so put it this way, if if you as a government have persuaded yourselves that the public sector is not the answer to our major infrastructural investment needs. So we, we are at a time in history there's, where there's no doubt that there is a huge need for infrastructure investment. Housing is one, but obviously climate infrastructure for both mitigation and adaptation purposes is another one. Huge amounts of infrastructure 
investment required. But at the same time, the public sector has persuaded itself, governments have persuaded itself that that cannot and should not be public money. You need to buy, tighten belts and, you know, all, all the stuff about, you know, running running the government budgets like a household, all that sort of stuff. So if you, if you, if you, if you cordon off public sector investment for public sector ownership of those assets as a political possibility, which is what happened during the New Deal, for example. I mean, that's the big difference between New Deal, Roosevelt and contemporary Biden is that, yes, there's public investment. But back then it was public investment for publicly owned infrastructures. Today it's smaller public investment for privately owned infrastructures, de-risking that private sector investment. If, if you persuade yourself that it cannot be pu big public investment for public ownership, then private investment is your only answer, right? Well, if private investment is your only answer, you pretty soon end up with asset managers because that it's asset managers that have under their management the vast bulk of surplus private capital in contemporary capitalism. So it's not surprising. It's, it, it's, in fact, there's almost an inevitability that the likes of Reeves and so on end up with asset managers as being the answer because the only other credible answer has been has been politically foreclosed before even beginning the conversation. If you even say the alternative, then you're not, you're not being serious. Yeah. You're not being grown up. Yeah. You're not being pragmatic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they, so they, they essentially, they, they, they have um, presented as the answer a set of institutions whose interests are not aligned with resolving those crises. Mm. And also going back to this idea of stewardship. So it's not just housing, it's, you know, water, infrastructure, it's the PFI contracts. We'll talk about that more in a minute. You want long-term stewardship of this kind of infrastructure. And look, plausibly, you could you could see in a world maybe where there's private investment that does that. Absolutely. But it would have to be a rate of return which is far lower than what we have, and that wouldn't please these people. And what we have instead is private investment, which is more like a trade. So buy cheap sell high, um, no capital investment, which of course is the exact opposite of how you should treat infrastructure. Absolutely. I mean, this should seem so obvious. Yeah. And yet, and yet not. I mean, you, you also talk in the book about, for instance, where, where people, and this is, we'll finish with the housing um, aspect of this conversation here. You talk about, oh, I can't remember who it is, they buy rental units and they say, well, you know what, well, actually this is underpriced because we can jack up rents. That's the definition of it, why it's underpriced. We can jack up rents. We can also cut costs. Yep. Oh, and also we don't have to actually invest in the capital investment required to maintain the building. And we can jack up rents more and we can cut costs and jack up rents more. That to them is success. For the people living in the building, that's catastrophe. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and that's absolutely right. And this, this is, I mean, particularly in the US, this has been a big, big story. And I think the one thing I, I, think the one thing I would say about this, which I think is very important, is that there is lots of anecdotal evidence out there. Lots of investigative journalists have done uh, reports where they've gone and talked to tenants of housing owned by uh, big asset managers, Blackstone and, and others, but not just Blackstone. Uh, in the US, and, and coming back with horror stories about you know infestations and mold on the walls and so on, that's fine. But you would you could you could find dissatisfied tenants in any part of that of the landlord economy, right? For me, what's much more compelling is actually that there's now a growing set of evidence which is not anecdotal, which is much more, uh, which which provides, I think, much more structural evidence of worse outcomes for tenants in housing owned by asset managers than in other than in housing owned by other types of private sector actors, particularly around eviction. So there's lots of academic studies now in different metropolitan regions of the U.S. where researchers have studied eviction rates in um, in housing owned by asset managers and, and, and studied eviction rates in housing owned by other types of private sector actors and controlling and, and controlling for the differences between the rental stock, they find substantially higher levels of, ev of eviction in housing owned by asset managers. So it's not just anecdotal evidence, there's actually much more compelling evidence of of substantively worse outcomes for tenants in this type of housing. And again, care homes, which is another asset they love. Yeah. We have a huge crisis in terms of elderly care in this country, in the US and whatnot. They don't get a great service. The workers are paid very poorly. You know, you have this kind of quasi xenophobic, I mean, it's also very real criticism, which is many of the care workers can't speak English or adequate English. So there was one person who recently died um, in a care home in this country 
the, the one of the care staff had called emergency services and they couldn't adequately explain what had happened to this person. And, and of course, the right says, look, this is because of too many immigrants. Yeah. I obviously disagree with that. I would say, well, no, it's because of how ownership works around these organizations. They want to extract the maximum possible money from the people using the service, pay the least possible, not invest in the infrastructure, add infinitum, and then sell it off. Yeah. I mean, care, you know, care homes have been a very, very, as you say, care homes have been a very, very... Um, um, active area of investment for asset managers, both in the UK and in the US. And 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 there, there was a study done by, I think it was, I'm not for sure it was Wharton, but a business, some business school professors a, a year or two ago where they looked at care homes across the US. And again, they did one of these studies when they compared outcomes in care homes owned by asset managers with other privately owned care homes across the whole of the US. And they found that mortality rates were substantively higher in care homes owned by asset managers than in other care homes. Now, they couldn't provide causal evidence as to why that was, but their suspicion was that the reason for that was uh, was less frontline nursing in care homes owned by asset managers. So they're cutting back on the most important type of cost, employee cost, um, so they found evidence of, of lower investment in frontline nursing in those asset manager owned, owned her homes. And their principal hypothesis is that, that was probably the reason for the high mortality outcomes. Crazy. Yeah. Do they have any of this? Okay, so we, we're talking principally about the OECD, the West. There are obviously some countries out there who are doing incredibly well when it comes to infrastructure investment, building lots of stuff. Yep. Namely China. Yep, absolutely. What role do asset funds and asset managers have in China with regards to infrastructure? Very little um, is my understanding. Certainly um, the, the major Western asset managers who, who are the focus of the book have a very limited presence. They have some presence, you know, so Brook, Brookfield owns, you know, Brookfield Asset Management, one of the big infrastructure asset managers uh, based in Canada, uh, has some uh, renewables assets in China, but it's, 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 they're a spec on a landscape that is dominated in every respect by state-owned entities. So if, if you're thinking about infrastructure investment in China, you are talking about um, you're talking about state-owned entities at every level, both in terms of the entities that build, develop, and then own those assets, whether that's wind and solar farms or whatever else it might be, and in terms of the banks that are lending the capital to, to lending the capital to do that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the really, really interesting things about this is in, in terms of that, you know, major long-term structural investment challenge that I was mentioning earlier, you know, in many ways, you, you know, you can say what you like about China's political economy, um, but at the same time, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's no, to my mind at least, there's no doubt that Ch China is better positioned to meet that in, in investment challenge um, strategically and rapidly than any country in the West, precisely because of the ongoing, very, very deeply ingrained role of the state in the economy. Whereas the West has essentially outsourced those investment challenges to the private sector and to markets. And if the private sector and markets decide that it's not in their financial interest at a particular point in time to meet that investment challenge, then they don't meet that investment challenge. They're not forced to. So we can't allocate resources as effectively as... Somewhere like China or no, I mean, I mean Vietnam. The, you know, or... an example that many people in the UK might be might be aware of recently. So, the, the, in, in the UK, the way in which a lot of uh, new renewables capacity gets built is through the provision of contracts by the government for for things like offshore wind, and and they will auction contracts where um, developers will bid to take those contracts, which means like a fifteen year contract to sell electricity at what is effectively a, a fixed price for the next fifteen years. But the government caps that price and then bidders bid prices down. So one will bid. So if the government caps the price at, say, 50 euros, 50 pounds per megawatt hour for the next 15 years, some will, someone will bid. The first bidder will say, well, we'll take a contract at 49 pounds. And the next will say, well, we'll go to 48 or we'll go to 47. And because the government caps it, um, what happened at the most recent auction was the developers were like, well, given our, given our materials costs and given our financing costs, if we can only sell our electricity for the next 15 years at 50, euros per 50 pounds per megawatt hour, we're not going to be making any money. And there were no bids. 
that's very different from how things work in China. Which I think this year in 2023, I, I might be wrong. I think this year it's built twice as much solar as there is the whole of the capacity in the United States. Yeah. I mean, this is, I, I, my, crazy. This is just, and this is not marketing. This is what my next book is about, is about renewables. And, 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 and I think on average for the last five years, China has has represented about 50% of global's renewables investment on average over the, over the last 5 years and I think and my guess is that this year in 2023 it will be well above 50% because those that political economy that governs investment um in renewables around the rest of the world is very very different in China so returning to the UK yep. we've mentioned Macquarie this Australian based uh, fund. They were involved in Thames Water, yes, which is a, a, a water company in the UK. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened when Macquarie bought Thames Water? Yeah, so Macquarie invested in Thames Water in, I think it was 2006 or 2008, one of those years, not sure. Um, now, I mean, just back Stepping back a second, so what happened, as 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 many viewers will know, is that the privatisation of the water industry occurred right at the end of the eighty of the eighties, um, early nineties. That period, initially, all of those companies were um, pu- became publicly listed entities, but over time, the, the ownership of a lot of them has changed, and the water sector, uh, specifically, but actually, kind of UK utility infrastructures more generally have been like a honeypot for us for global asset managers over the last few decades um not least the water and the electricity sector and and so thames's ownership changed many times over the last couple of decades but in a, a, you know, probably the most significant moment of change was when macquarie came in it wasn't the only owner but it was the controlling shareholder it came in in a consortium of which it was the lead investor again 2006 2008 um and it invested through one of its main European infrastructure funds. Um, it was invested, I think, for about ten years in Thames Water. It was the it was the lead in, the lead shareholder before exiting five or six years ago. Um, during that period, um, lots of things happened. Uh, but to cut a very long and complicated story short, and nothing I'm going to say here is, I think, any in any way controversial. You could actually read the same story in the FT. FT has been great at covering Thames. There's some very good infrastructure journalists there. Um, they put loads of debt into the into the business. When the water companies were privatized, they were privatized debt free. Uh, now, collectively, they have I don't know something in the order of fifty billion of debt uh, attached to them. So Macquarie put lots of debt into the business. At the same time as it was putting debt into the business, it took a lot of money out of the business. Uh, it, through, through various mechanisms, uh, not least dividends and shareholder loans, with, with a with a principal mechanism, and by any reckoning, it it woefully underinvested in the physical infrastructure, um, and so Thames was repeatedly during the period of Macquarie's ownership, repeatedly um, chastised by the regulator, by the industry regulator, off what. Um, and by and by, you know, in, in any number of campaign groups and activist groups and so on, um, and and, poli- and politicians for underinvestment and for um, the, the, the you know the problems that come out of underinvestment in the infrastructure, which is things like leaks and 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 uh, and uh, raw uh, sewage being um, released into river into rivers and uh, around around the uh, the region of, of Thames's control and so it was kind of a it was kind of a case study I think in the broader um, set of problems which I try to describe in the book which which is which is basically consumers getting a raw deal because they're paying more and more for services that are getting worse and worse because the steward in this case Macquarie is really not interested at heart in careful custodianship of that asset it's interested in minimizing the costs that it incurs while that infrastructure is under its ownership and maximizing the revenues in this case the rates that it can charge uh, consumers during that period and so and so they were you know Macquarie got slapped on the wrist a couple of times a couple of very you know minor fines 
Um, and actually the biggest fine that Thames received, I think it was maybe maybe 100, 120 million pounds, I think it was, got levied ironically a year or so after Macquarie had sold out its its, its main shareholding. And so my argument, you know, we'll off, you know, Thames is much in the news these days um, and, its, and its current shareholders get a lot of flack. And I kind of understand that, but personally, I feel a degree of sympathy for the today's shareholders because on my reading, Thames got turned into a, a basket case by Macquarie and, it, and the current shareholders are the ones that are kind of being left left kind of holding the bag and they should have done better due diligence I think when they undertook the investment you know I think they got they bought a dog at, at the end of the day but it had been turned into a dog by, by Macquarie. Mm. I mean the UK water industry since privatization in the early 1990s is just an incredible story so like you say they've been they've been saddled with tens of billions of, of pounds worth of debt debt which was used to buy them and then put on them Again, a bit like Manchester United Football Club, if yep. people are sort of not familiar with that. You know, the Glazers buy United by getting debt they then place on the club, debt which was guaranteed against the club's assets. You know, I think for most normal people... I mean, it works in exactly the same way. Yeah. Most normal people that, how is that possible? That's how <laughs> lots of these deals work. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's how, you know, clever people make lots of money. It is. Um, and the price of water bills is double relative to um, just the sort of base rate. I think it's RPI inflation since 1990. So the bills have gone up extraordinarily, you know, far more than the basic rate of inflation. They've got all this debt. They've also paid tens of billions of pounds to shareholders over the last 25 years, whatever it is. Um, they've paid huge amounts of executive pay. And then you have the sort of government saying, well, we would need about 200 billion pounds to actually build the kind of infrastructure we need so that we aren't dumping crap into rivers and coasts. Uh, we can't afford to do that. Obviously, that's just far too much money. Well, we know exactly where the money's gone, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's very. It's a very clear and that's the transfer problem. of money. It's gone. It has gone. It's gone. You can't get it back. And, and, I, and I think, you know, my, I would say that, you know, one of the remarkable things, I think, is that, even the FT, I think, would argue that privatization of the utilities in the UK, as it's been done in the UK, has been a disaster. It's been a complete failure. I think telecoms is probably the only case where maybe that's not true. Um, if, if you look at how can, if you look specifically in the measure of, if you look at how consumers have done, con consumers in terms of telecoms prices have done reasonably well in the period since privatization but actually that's only really because mobile came along and 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 provided significant competition to fixed line during that period that's the main part and and telecoms not only is it the one where consumers have done okay it's the only one where if you invested in those telecoms companies and have remained invested you would have done badly in every other sector investors have done well and consumers have done i mean badly. i would also add perhaps that telecoms is quite unique in so much as obviously it's a digital technology and that's been subject to what we would call deflationary trends because obviously it's much cheaper to make a phone call now than it was 25 yeah. years ago that's not because of privatization it's because of technology yeah. whereas you know a pipe that carries water is a pipe that carries water yeah, exactly so a little bit and 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 I, I guess the point i try to make in this book is that so Privatisation of, of infrastructure in the UK, but also many other places, has been a disaster. But one of the reasons, and I think this is the point I would, would, would want to stress, is that one of the reasons it's been particularly bad in the UK is precisely because the, of the disproportionate involvement of asset management firms. So there's, there's privatisation in general, and, there's, and then there's privatisation asset manager style, which is, and one of the, and one of the, so one of the arguments I make in the book and and it's an argument I, I i i hold to very firmly is that is that asset managers are not only it, it, let me get this right asset managers in terms of how they typically carry out this investment are not only inappropriate owners of infrastructures on which we all rely on in our daily lives but they are about the most inappropriate owners imaginable and 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 the reason for that is, is it goes back to something you mentioned earlier which is the fact that the business model for the most part is not buying assets for holding them in the long term it is for the most part buying assets knowing when you buy them that not only are you likely to but you have to sell those assets 
within a relatively short space of time. And if you know that you have to sell the asset, whether it's Thames Water or an apartment block or whatever else it is, in six or seven years' time, you have no interest in carrying out investment that might provide benefits in any meaningful shape or form beyond that seven-year time horizon. So do you, do you have an interest in providing real good re repair work for sewage leakages? No, you have an interest in providing kind of band-aid solutions that might just about last for the next six or seven years. And then you've sailed off into the sunset after that seven year period. So there's this inherent short termism in the asset management industry that makes the ownership of assets like housing and infrastructure, which are long term assets by their very nature, completely inappropriate. And, and this is because and I don't want to get too sort of esoteric, but it's an important point. This is because historically, the bulk of investment by asset managers in housing and infrastructure has been has been has been done through investment funds that are fixed term funds. So they set up these investment vehicles, an infrastructure fund or a real estate fund that that is that is scheduled to wind up nine or ten years later. And the money to, and the money that has been given to them to invest by pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and to get returned to them after that nine or ten year period. So not only not only do they often want to, but they have to sell those assets. They have to sell them before the fund is wound up in order to be able to return um, that money to their investors. And something like 90% of um, commitments of capital to these um, infrastructure funds managed by asset managers over the last 20 or 30 years have been to funds of this short-term type. You will often hear asset managers say, oh, we're long-term investors. We run these so-called perpetual or permanent funds that invest for the long term they do run them but historically they've been in the minority yeah so this is open and closed exactly. funds yeah you said it's sort of it's a hugely important point which is you know some are open and most are closed yes and they'll be getting a contract for say like okay we're running all the parking in chicago we'll talk about that yeah. great story yeah um 70 year contract well, the fund closes in ten years. Yes, exactly. And again, it's one of those. It's one of those brilliant things where you could talk to you could talk to my dad's Iranian. You could talk to an Iranian villager with no education past fourteen. They would say that's a really dumb idea. <laughs> yeah. But you can you can get some you know MBA or some Harvard educated politician, Oxford educated politician in this country, the United States. They go, no, this is just how it works. It's yeah. very clever. This Absolutely. is progress. This is smart. This is pragmatic. And and you know, the older I get, the more I realize actually, sort of basic elementary common sense is so at odds. With you know the smart people running our society, absolutely, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So sh should we just ban those kinds of funds being able to buy infrastructure? Is that well, sort of an easy win? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this that's a very good that's a very good point. I mean, my argument um, is that I think that um, if we are going to have asset managers um, investing in, in 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 these types of assets that I talk about in the book and that we've been talking about uh, today. Then, then certainly it should come with certain um, constraints that in the past have typically not existed, and and I think that um, al allowing them to invest through in long term infrastructures that that for, for which long term capital investment is is a lifeblood through these inherently short-term vehicles just strikes me as completely incongruous and and should not happen. I mean, this is not, I mean, maybe we can talk about this later, this is not the only way in which um, one might want to clamp down on this type of phenomenon, but it's definitely one. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, and I think that there are some governments around the world that have made, you know, relatively positive noises. Macquarie owned... Was it Copenhagen Airport or Brussels Airport? One of these airports. I, I talk about it in the book, but I can't remember which one it was. And did its typical thing, which was like made really good noises about being a long-term custodian, and then and then you know ran with the money after a few years later. And 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 you know, I'm pretty sure it was the Danish government was not impressed, and and put through some reviews about what, you know how this can happen and why this can happen and what we should do about it in the future. But for the most part, most governments have not done much about this at all. And it comes back precisely to what we were talking about earlier, which is that you can't do much about it if you've got yourself in a position of being reliant on these actors. If you've persuaded yourself that the private sector have the answer, asset managers become the answer. So the last thing you're going to do is clamp down on them because they're the answer. 
and 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 not surprisingly, what asset managers this is you know, this is classic stuff. When governments like in the UK and regulators start making noises about clamping down on these things, the very same day, the asset managers come out with press releases and say, well, we're going to stop investing in the UK. Hmm. See how you like it then. And the politicians shit their pants. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's, it's, it's that simple. Well, you can imagine a sort of a, a, a left populist politician in this country and they would say, I think quite reasonably, we're not going to allow certain people to invest in certain industries. We're not, that's just, we're not going to, it's not going to happen. Yep. Nothing personal, guys. You know, if, if Navarro Media was running the government, I think we'd probably have consensus on that. Not much else. Something like that. It seems quite common sense. But then, of course, like you say, um, you would see a flood of press releases and people that even slightly disagree with you, because that's how modern politics works, would say, well, look, we're not going to have any investment in the country. Even though they might agree on the substance of it that they shouldn't be investing. I mean, you saw this with Brexit, right? people who claim so many things politically, if it meant you could bash the other side, then you would you would use it. Um, and that that's absolutely right. And it, what's interesting to me, this is a bit of a tangent, what's interesting to me is I honestly think the right will come after this, the populist right will come, probably in Europe, because we're seeing this rising tide of right-wing sentiment across Europe right now, with Britain being something of an exception. I think they'll come after this before the left does, which to me is terrifying. I can see a right-wing populist saying, we do not want American asset funds operating in Italy, France, yeah, no, absolutely. Spain. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. And what does the left do? Does the left go, no, 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 we do. Asset funds are progressive. And, that's, yeah. and that is the situation, not to that extent. We found ourselves in that position time after time for the last 20 years, defending liberal, progressive global capitalism when it's the one thing that's screwing us the most. And that doesn't mean you side with the far right, but it means hmm, maybe we should try and lead the conversation. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I think that's, I think that's absolutely what will happen. And I, and I, I, you know, it was interesting to me when I started doing work on, um, on Blackstone and housing in the US context, and I've published a couple of articles in, you know, obscure academic journals about, about this. The, the first people in the, in the kind of public realm to approach me about it from the US was the right. Um, I think it was Senator Josh Hawley's team got in touch with me because they see they see this as an easy as an easy win for them. There's a great line. I can't remember who said this, but they it summed up so much with Trump. Trump was an uprising of family capital against global capital, um, which is you know petty bourgeois historically. We had this conversation with Dan Evans. Yeah, you know that this was the big class behind the rise of Hitler and and fascism. I'm not suggesting that everybody who owns a small business is a fascist. Of course not. Uh, sometimes they've been involved in left wing you know politics too. But it's that, you know, it's the family business versus BlackRock, Blackstone. They're buying the assets, they're destroying the community, et cetera, et cetera, which has the kernel of something really positive. Yep. But, you know, the left's not at the races. Yeah. Quickly before we finish. Yes. Chicago. Yes. We talked about Macquarie and Thames Water. Yeah. Tell me about Chicago and its experience with asset funds. Yeah. So this is, this is, these, these, this is a great case. Uh, and I, um, I rely heavily on the work. There's a, there's a great um, Chicago uh, scholar come journalist called Stephanie Farmer who's done this great work, which I'll rely on in the book about this, where she looked at... So Morgan Stanley, its asset management arm, um, uh, Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Partners, in, again, about 10, 15 years ago, closer to 15, I think, carried out two... It led two major investments in parking infrastructure, uh, in Chicago, one of which was the city's parking meter system. So the meters around the around the whole city, um, and the other one was parking garages um, ar around the city. So what what happened was that the city of Chicago they put out um, these seventy uh, seventy or ninety nine year uh, contracts where the the bidder would, would would take on the job of managing those infrastructures, the parking infrastructures, but also earning the money paid by the, the parkers. Um, and so Morgan, so Morgan Stanley brought these on. Lo and behold, Chicago within the space of a few years went from being one of the cheapest places in America to park to being the most expensive place in the country to park. The not, su not surprising, um, given that that's the pure interest of, of these asset managers. So that was, that was interesting. Um, but what and but and and but not necessarily unique. But the thing that that was particularly interesting that Farmer found was that the the way that um, the contracts were written between the city and Morgan Stanley um, 
were very, very restrictive on, on the city in terms of what it could or could not do in the future. So, for example, um, if, if um, the city, because it wanted to have, have a street festival or something, wanted to, um, if, if running a street festival meant um, that two or three parking meters or however many it was couldn't be used for a few days, it had to provide compensation of a particular amount that was written into co- into the contract to Morgan Stanley for those parking meters being taken out of commission. And what Farmer shows in, in, in his really clever way is that basically the way in which the city of Chicago came to plan its urban fabric over the next de- decade or so was massively shaped and constrained by this ridiculous contract that it got mm. into. It didn't allow itself to do certain things like things that were beneficial to cyclists, like opening up cycling lanes around the city because it would end up may having to make these payments to Morgan Stanley that were written into this contract. So not only was this really bad in the kind of direct sense of parking fees going up uh, uh, massively, but it had this really constraining influence on the future evolution of, of, of the city of Chicago in terms of its friendliness to things like cyclists and other things like that. So it's a it's a really it's a really interesting case, and 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 I think that um, the reason I like the reason I like that case and find it particularly interesting is it does make this really important point that when you're when you're buying infrastructure, when you're owning infrastructure, you are uh, owning an asset that shapes the life of a city, that shapes the life of, of a community. Um, and if, and if, if governments enter into contracts with asset managers or other private sector investors for that, for that matter, that, that, that constrain the way in which those assets can be managed, built out and so on going forward, then that's a, re- that's a really, really significant thing. And I don't know what phrase you actually use, but this idea of your fragmenting the urban environment. What's yeah. the word you use? Yeah, so it's uh, splintering. Splintering. The splintering. Right. Yeah, again, it's a book by some geographers or architects, uh, Marvin and Graham. Yeah, and and so this, this is a, this is an important point. So what governments have found, of course, is that if if you have take electricity is the best example of this. If 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 you have like historically, electricity was owned and managed in a completely integrated way. So entities had regional monopolies or even national monopolies over generation, transmission, distribution, and everything. What they found is that they couldn't readily sell assets on this kind of integrated basis. That it was much easier to sell assets if they kind of unbundled them or splintered them, both vertically by which I mean generation, transmission, distribution, and geographically. Um, so, so if you can disaggregate assets, take them apart, and sell bits and sell them on a bits and pieces basis, that's much more attractive to the private sector. But of course, the private sector only wants to buy the ones that look attractive. So you get these kind of, you get these other assets that are completely unattractive. And historically, if it was all owned and controlled on an integrated basis, you had this inherent cross subsidization within the public sector, which doesn't work anymore. If you disaggregate it all and sell off the juicy bits to the private sector, the public sector just gets left with. And housing is a, it, housing's a good example of that, right? Housing becomes residualized. Council housing, the only bits that are left that haven't gone under right to buy are the ones that no one wants to buy. Yeah, and, and this idea as well of um, splintering, you know, you can't build a functional, efficient, effective cityscape because, you know, the bus lanes and the buses belong to that company and the parking spaces exactly. belong to that company. And they're, well, okay, how do we build an efficient design that works for people? We can't yeah. because you have eight or nine different interests yeah. all with it, it runs their com- eye on their own and, interest, and, and you know, thing. The, and, and again, exactly right. And Chicago is the, great, is the, the best example of that in, in farmer's work. It, you know, that that type of financialization of the city for want of a better for want of a better word runs counter to the traditional idea of joined up urban planning so i suppose somebody watching all of this might be very receptive to the criticisms and so that's all well and good it's very easy to um pick apart something what's the alternative yeah um and like you say right now asset management is increasingly what defines private sector investment in infrastructure so what is the alternative? I suppose that starts with the question, how did we used to build infrastructure yeah. before all of this? Yeah. I mean, again, there's, there's, no, there's no uniform answer to that. But in general, historically, um, in, in infrastructures that, are, that provide essential services, 
of the types we've been talking about were generally much more under the ownership and control of the public sector historically than they are today. Um, ironically, uh, you know, lots of people think about the US as the kind of the home of, of, of the private sector and of small government and of neoliberalism. Ironically, essential infrastructures are much more still under public ownership in the US than is the case in the UK. I mean, the UK has gone much further than the US or indeed anywhere down the kind of selling off anything you can sell off. Um, but in general, um, the, the public sector was was much more um, the custodian and owner of these types of assets. Now, the last thing I am is someone who, who looks at the kind of public sector through rose-tinted spectacles and, and kind of pretends that everything was hunky-dory when the public sector owned. I mean, the public sector can be just as ropey an owner and custodian of these types of assets as the private sector can. Let's not kid ourselves about that. So just as, you know, just as we shouldn't, you know, uncritically chastise the private sector, we shouldn't uncritically romanticise the public sector. But I do think that at least with the public sector, you have the possibility of different types of outcomes than you do with the types of private sector ownership in general and asset manager ownership more particularly. Not the, not the inevitability, but at least the possibility of different types of outcomes. So the, so the, the public sector might, used to be much more centrally involved. The, and, and that didn't mean that the public sector built these assets, but it meant that the public sector funded the assets and funded the development of them own them and then received any revenues that were earned from um, from the the use of those assets, uh, whether it was water infrastructures or, or or transportation infrastructure or anything else. And I think this is the this is one of the things that frustrates me about the argument. You know, the public sector can't put this on the public balance sheet. You know, uh, we can't take on that extra debt. You know, th- there's a big difference between the public sector borrowing for, say, the provision of services or borrowing to fund transfer payments than borrowing to develop revenue generating assets i mean there's a and and that just kind of gets completely lost there's a fundamental distinction there it's not like you would be um you know borrowing and then and no no money coming back this is a, com- a completely different and so that's the way it it worked much more commonly historically and so i i think i would i personally would agree with the, the arguments that were um you know, very, very central, for example, to early arguments about the Green New Deal five, six years ago, which was that which was that we need a, an emboldened public sector in terms of the financing and ownership of, of, of critical infrastructures, not least in energy, but not not only in energy. Um, and 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 as you know, again, I, I, go, I keep going back to the FT, but as lots of people in the FT would, would argue that, you know, the, the public sector can finance these things typically more cheaply than the private sector can. Um, and especially given, given the rents that the private sector um, typically siphons off in addition, um, it's not just cheaper, but much, but much cheaper. It, it can do these things. The very last thing we should be encouraging is ownership by asset managers through these inherently short-term vehicles. I mean, Canada's an inter- I think Canada is an interesting, an interesting case, right? Which is that, so... Um, in the industry, in the infrastructure investment industry, it's often referred to as the, as the ca- Canadian model, because what big Canadian pension funds do, um, in a way that's different from big US or UK public pension funds, is they do a lot of direct infrastructure investment, where they where they buy and own these assets directly, rather than by relying on asset managers in their short term um, vehicles. Now, that doesn't mean that the Canadian pension, pen, public pension plan investment board is always a great custodian of these types of types of assets but i think when it says it's in it for the long term that's much more likely to be true than when macquarie says it's in it for the long term which it typically is not so i i I think that there are different ways of doing things i guess the i guess the way i would generalize this is to say is to say look if, if 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 you think my argument in the book is broadly right, which is that the phenomenon that I've kind of diagnosed is a broadly negative phenomenon. There are essentially two ways of um, limiting what asset managers do. 
Okay, so asset going right back to the first question you ask about what what are asset managers? Asset managers are entities that take money from others and invest it. So there's two choke points, right? There's there's the raising of investment, and there's the opportunities to invest. So there's there's two things you can do, broadly speaking. You can try to limit the amount of capital that they have at their disposal, and you can try and limit their ability to invest in certain types of things. So we've talked about the latter of those already. So as you said, one thing you one thing you can potentially do is say, no, we're going to have certain types of things that we just don't want certain types of actors owning and buying. We just think it's wrong. We just don't think it that should happen. And you can do that. Governments are a million miles from, I think, thinking about doing that. The other thing you can say is, you know, I think if you, so if you, if you are a fireman working in Pennsylvania and you were to find out that your retirement savings are invested in a fund that owns rental ho- the rental housing of your neighbours and is ra- and is jacking up the rents on that housing, you probably wouldn't be particularly happy. You might not be particularly happy about it. So I think the other possibility is for the entities that give them the monies to invest to be much more proactive about shaping what can and cannot happen with that money. You know, the big public pension plans could say, we're not going to put money into um, investment funds that are buying up and jacking up rental and rental housing. And and I think that is another, that's an area of kind of political intervention that is entire, it seems to me entirely possible. Mm. Um, but again, I think part of the problem here is that, you know, most people who have their retirement savings invested through their public pension have no idea where that money is going. They have no idea what the trustee of their punch of their pension fund is doing in terms of allocation to different investment funds managed by Blackstone or I mean they have no idea. But I think that you know I've been in conversations with uh, with with certain unions in the US who are actively trying to do precisely these types of things. They're trying to politicize the investment um, of those of the of the retirement savings of those unions by talking to the pension fund trustees and trying to make them aware of exactly these types of issues. I mean, that's as well another sort of counter argument be, well, people have to have pensions and what else would they invest in? Well, there's literally a million and one, <laughs> yeah. not, maybe not literally, there's figuratively a million and one things they can invest in commodities, sovereign debt. Well, they can just put it in bonds. an index. They just put it in an index tracker. Well, well precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred, hundred and one, maybe not many yeah. one, hundred and one things they, yeah. they can invest in and, and they don't need and to do this. No, they don't. And here's the thing, right? Which is that the, is, which is the, the, the industry comes back and says, well, if they don't, then they're missing out, missing out on superior returns. But that's actually, again, I'm no expert on this particular question, but there's a, there's a, there's a great academic, Ludovic Fallop, who I think his name is in Oxford, and he's done lots of research showing that over the long term, private equity funds, infrastructure funds, real estate funds do not generate superior returns f- than simple index tracking funds. But equally, even, even if they did, even if your pension was 5% better, if your water bills are twice as high, your energy is twice <laughs> exactly. as high, your neighbor's being evicted, everything's outsourced, your kids can't buy a yeah. house. Yeah. I mean... And, 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 and absolutely. But the problem, right, is that drawing those connections is hard. For people, I mean, it's, it took me a you know a long amount of time to pull all that together, and 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 and, for, and you know in most people's cases, th- 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 drawing those connections between kind of what's happening to their pension and what's happening to renters who are in living houses, they feel like a million miles away from each other, but of course they're not a million miles away from each other. Well, I'm very glad you've condensed it all into the book, <laughs> so it won't take our listeners and our viewers years to work that all out. Thank you so much, Brett. This has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot and I'm grateful that you had me on. Our pleasure.